This is your life, and who could ask for two more glamorous co-conspirators than Sally Thompson and Paula Wilcox, stars of Man About the House, and about to get one back on a practical joker pal of theirs, whose taxi should be arriving at this road right now. So if you'll keep an eye out and give me the wink as soon as he's here, and we'll be ready to go. Thank you, girls. He's coming in the taxi, I hope, with Peter Fraser Jones, the producer of the program, to uh, film a, a special insert of a concert, a rather tatty concert, perhaps, uh, for the show. Now, I hope that that yeah, concert will not, in fact, is he already? Oh, Lord, okay. quite the concert you expected, but I hope you'll enjoy it twice as much, because star, that man about the house, Richard O'Sullivan, this is your life. I'm too young. <laughs> A slight bit of a shock there. Richard, how do you feel now? I feel much older. <laughs> <laughs> well, Richard O'Sullivan, this is your life. And believe it or not, this young man here is celebrating some 21 years in show business. And here's a picture of you, Richard, as a nine-year-old schoolboy. Now, not many people know that that schoolboy was also a film star. And we'll be hearing more about that remarkable career later. Today, Man About the House is a chart-topping comedy success. But Sally, there was one funny moment in the show we at home all missed, wasn't there? Oh, yes. <laughs> he kept forgetting his lines. And it was all about um, that news of the frozen north. Right. <laughs> Every time he kept coming to this line, it wouldn't come out right. Yes, and everybody started laughing. We did, the audience did. Yeah, and the more the audience laughed, I think the more, the more we forgot it, and the more we forgot it, the more the, the audience laughed. Yeah. <laughs> Till in the end, they actually wanted us to get it wrong. <laughs> well, Richard, we know that you finally mastered that tongue twister because we've got hold of that film. So let's take a look at the final version with all the tries, the one that we, of yours, saw at home. Do you know, I read a book once. <laughs> and up with the frozen north, you see. And when an Eskimo gets a cold, all the women of the tribe well, well, the young women, really. See, they all, they all strip off and they get into bed with him, you see, on the theory that they're all going to sweat it out together. Oh, yeah? Does it work? No, but it doesn't seem to bother them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that television house that made millions laugh, but the happiest house for you, Richard, I know, is the one here in Chiswick, West London, where you were brought up. And from there, of course, your mother Ellen, father Jackie, and younger brother John. <laughs> Uh, Jackie, uh, today the name of Richard O'Sullivan is well known to television audiences, but the day this bonnie baby we see here came into the world, you had another name ready, didn't you? Yes. Maureen. What, what name? Maureen. Maureen. Uh, would you please explain that to us? Yes. Well, I came home on leave from the RAF during the war. I found the hospital. And I inquired about my wife, and they said, you're about to a baby girl. So I definitely made the name Maureen. And then, I, then I've not had a nice scotch. <laughs> so I phoned up later, and I was informed that uh, there was two Mr. Sullivan's in the hospital. I gave them to a baby boy. <laughs> <laughs> that so come as a shock. <laughs> indeed, a terrible shock. So then I went out and had two double scotches. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Richard, you were born on May the 7th, 1944. Now, with your mother, you were evacuated to a small village in Leicestershire. And when you return, uh, ten months later, wartime London is under uh, nightly attacks from flying bombs. And Ellen, during one raid, uh, baby Richard here became a, a war casualty of sorts, didn't he? Yes. 
<laughs> I was getting ready for bed, and I just put it by the fire to keep it nice and warm for it. And the sun <laughs> went, and if I picked him up and sat like, on the fire. I can't. She was warming her potty by the fire when the sun went. <laughs> <laughs> and I ran to the shelter where Richard stuck to the pot. You mean to put him on the red hot potty? Yes. I suppose you're too young to remember that. And we don't want to see the scars. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, John, you're a copywriter with an advertising agency, but as a boy, you also did a bit of acting. Now, wasn't there a time when you had a chance of joining a brother Richard in a film? Yeah, I went for an audition to play the part of Richard's brother. And there were eight of us in a line, and I was feeling rather confident of getting the part for yes, some yes. reason, which I can't explain. And uh, yeah. I was the last in the line, and everyone here was taking ages, this producer. And he came to me, smile on my face, and he said, Oh no, he's got the wrong shape of face, he's no good. <laughs> you know, I felt like Quasimodo's second cousin. So, uh, <laughs> that was a part I didn't get. <laughs> I bet it wasn't. Well, Richard, when you were six, your mother sends you for six shillings a time Saturday morning elocution lessons in the nearby Corona Stage School. But after just a few lessons, you're sent home from school. That's because I had a special message for Richard's parents. The teacher who discovered then and encouraged your acting talent for more than 20 years ago, Rona, Rona Knight. Knight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rona, what was the, uh, the special message? Uh, well, I wanted to ask if he could have full-time lessons, because after just a few lessons, I, I was impressed with uh, his poise and confidence, and uh, I thought, even though he was so young, I felt he had all the qualities to make a good actor, and we're all so very proud of what you've done since. Thank you, Rona Knight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now, you didn't know it then, obviously, Richard, but those lessons were to lead to a life of excitement and adventure. And after an audition in which you compete against 300 other boys, you're chosen for a starring role in a film that's to be made in Venice. And just a few weeks before your ninth birthday, you say goodbye to your parents for the first time to board a plane that is to fly a little boy from Chiswick to stardom. Now, that film, The Stranger's Hand, told the story of a young boy searching for his father, a Secret Service agent, being held captive by foreign agents. And here you are in that scene, the moment when your search is over. Daddy. <laughs> Daddy. This is Joe. Joe? Tremendous. That was very funny, isn't it? <laughs> I thought it was very good. How did it feel at that age to be playing opposite such an international star actor as Trevor Howard? It felt okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the point was, I, I, the thing was that uh, at, at that age, there, there was a, a director, an Italian director, who was terrific. And the only way he was going to get me to uh, get it together to be pretty good, he said, if you're very good, he was really mad, he said, he said hey, Richard, he said, if you're very good, lots of money will come from heaven. <laughs> <laughs> this is very true. And uh, so I said, okay, it's a good contract, isn't it? So I, I tried it, and I, was, uh, I did it, and he said, cut, and no money came. <laughs> so he said, Richard, you better try again. So I tried again, and suddenly all this money came from heaven, and all this lots of money came around. And uh, what I found out later was that he'd given lots of little pennies and lira to all the crew, and when he said, yeah, that's okay, he, all the crew flicked up all these coins, <laughs> and I thought it was money from heaven. <laughs> and uh, I thought, it's a good living, this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't imagine Trevor Howard was paid that, mate. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> but right now, he's making his latest picture, Conduct Unbecoming, but he's taken time literally straight off the set to be here, Trevor Howard. I'm not a madman, but I'm glad you are a madman. What about this boy? What do you remember of him on that occasion? Well, it's a long time ago. We won't go into that. <laughs> a couple of years ago. <laughs> yes, and uh, I said to him, you've got to start the game in something difficult, something like Shakespeare. And about three years later, 
I went to Stratford on Avon, and there he was. He started at 12. I didn't do it till about I was 18 or 19. Awfully nervous, don't you think he's nervous? He'll have to grow one of those mutton chops. Great to see you. <laughs> Thank you, Trevor. All right. Well, I know those were very happy days with Trevor, but for you there was one very special day, your ninth birthday, and this is quite remarkable that we should have this story for you. And during a break in filming, someone who thinks you might be lonely so far away from home asks you this question. Hello, Richard. What would you like as a present for your birthday? That's the director himself who had the pennies from heaven. He's flown from Milan to meet you again for the first time in 21 years, Italy's famous Mario Soldati. <laughs> Well, it's impossible. It's Mar impossible. <laughs> Mario, when, when you asked him this question, what was Richard's reply to your offer? Well, I don't know. I had to collect my, my strength in this moment. It's difficult. Well, he said, well, he said something about perhaps I had a watch like that. And he said, please, I would like that. See? I would like that. So it was given to him. Uh, I've still got it. It's worth a fortune today. It's gold. <laughs> oh, you, 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 you chose him uh, from, from what, as we said, 300 boys and started, started this career. Well, you know, uh, what, what was, what did he well, get? the idea is this, that uh, to direct a child is very difficult always. But when you are a foreigner, and it, uh, you don't speak the same language by, uh, of, of the child, it's even more difficult. So why did I choose? Because it, among all the children I've seen, it was the only one that gave me, it, it was safe, because it was, it was small, he was a professional actor, a small, accomplished little comedian. It was perfect. Ciao, Richard. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao and thank you. Again. I'll see you in about 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Mario Soldati, thank you. Well, obviously, Richard, you had great fun out there. And, and uh, Ellen, did he, did he write home often to tell you what was going on? Yes, he often he wrote home frequently, <laughs> telling me about Trevor Howard's... Uh, Go on, Mum, keep going, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Yeah, yeah. You're and well. a little yeah. playmate, Prince. Who? What is it? A playmate who was a prince? Yes. Well, obviously, he wrote you plenty of letters anyway, but before you are even a teenager, you're a veteran of more than a dozen films, and still only 12 years old, you receive one of the greatest honours in any actor's life, an invitation to join the Shakespeare Memorial Company at Stratford-on-Avon. And here tonight, an actress from the same play 18 years ago, television and West End stage star, Prunella Scales. Well, Prunella, what do you remember of Richard? Oh, he was very clever, you see. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, Martin loves Labour's Lost, I suppose, it's one of the most difficult parts in the Hill of Shakespeare, but he knew all the lines long before everybody else, and we all loved him, he really did. And um, he had this costume that looked like a sort of Christmas tree, but inside it was this very butch, very tough little boy with a highly coloured vocabulary who uh, <laughs> played poker in the dressing room with all the wardrobe ladies. <laughs> Did I win? What? Oh, yes, all the time, all the time. But I think he's one of the few child actors who's really made it as a grown-up professional. I think that's why, because he's sort of kept his sense of reality. I'm the greatest possible fan, honestly. I, ne I never miss the show. Thank you for another scales. Thank you. <laughs> At 14, Richards, you've entertained scores of audience in both the theatre and the cinema, but school days aren't over yet, and you still have to go back to the classroom, and it's there one audience isn't at all impressed. That was when he took over a new role as teacher for the day. A friend from your school days, Sheila. now leading actress and musical Sheila comedy star, yes, Sheila White. <laughs> So uh, Richard wasn't cut out to be a teacher. No, not very, no, he wasn't very good actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, he was in the senior group, and I was one of the junior students. And um, he took over a lesson because our teacher was ill, and it was a Shakespeare reading. So I thought, well, that's going to be funny for a start. <laughs> and he started off, and he was reading Hamlet, and it was like Richard Burton and Larry Grayson at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm, I'm not being fierce, you really, because he's he's a fantastic dramatic actor as well and uh, 
Yes, we know you are. And um, there's lots of people, Eamon, that aren't here tonight that are great friends of Richard and they'd like to be here, but unfortunately they can't all be. And I'm very proud to be here tonight. And um, Shut up. Don't say any more. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila White. <laughs> Well, obviously you weren't cut out for uh, teaching, Richard, but you might have been a pop star, because when you aren't acting, you look forward to your weekly piano lessons. You're so keen on music, you get together with some no, no, school no, pals <laughs> and form a jazz group. <laughs> and at local charity shows, you entertain with sounds like this. Now, that sound hasn't been heard for 16 years, but for you, we brought your friends in the school jazz group back together again. On piano, Larry Dawn. Dad. Ah, oh, Dad. On drums, Roy Hahn. On bass, Alan Collinsville. And with them, singer Valerie Buckley. Valerie, yeah, I'm, no. I'm told he uh, was a bit of a penis with oh, you. Oh, yes, he was. Rubbish. He was our penis. I was rubbish. Darling. Rubbish. You were absolutely beautiful. It's lovely to see you again. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> come on, we want you to join us. Will you yeah, do that? Come on. Yes. Come Anything on. in a... C F or G, he says. <laughs> Fantastic! <laughs> Thank you, Eddie, Roy, Gary, and Maestro Sala. <laughs> well, now, it's not long... <laughs> I need that. That was fantastic. <laughs> it's not long, Richard, before you're packing your bags again, chosen to play Jim Hawkins in an American television spectacular of Treasure Island. You're just 15 when you fly off to New York, and I know you were particularly excited about that trip because it would give you a chance to meet again a favorite cousin of yours, your mother's sister's lad. And I bet it was the same story for him. He could introduce you as a film star to all your, his friends. But when my big moment came, Richard was speechless. That same cousin, you haven't seen him for 14 years. He's flown from his home in New York to meet you again, Dickie Reynolds. Oh. <laughs> I can't imagine Richard being lost for words, so you better tell us what happened. Well, in those days, Richard was my only claim to fame, and I was constantly telling my friends about my famous cousin, the movie actor. So I invited him around to a party one evening, and as I remember it, the host was a little too generous. Richard had, I think, more drinks than he realized, didn't speak to a soul, and they just thought he was a little temperamental, I think, being in the movies. Uh, not at all realizing, of course, that he was bombed. <laughs> Thank you, Dickie Reynolds. <laughs> well, fully recovered, Richard. More films follow. Next stop, it's Rome. And here's a picture of you at 16, playing one of the most difficult roles of your life as the boy king in Cleopatra. I'm very beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Now, that film kept you in Italy for eight months. But being a soccer fan, you have a special reason for flying home weekends, don't you? Well, I do. Uh, I'm f unfortunately, I, I, I uh, look after Chelsea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. They're terrific. Of They're course. A couple of problems at the moment. We'll, s <laughs> we'll sort it out. <laughs> But as well as being a fan, you're a footballer yourself, and you often turn out with a showbiz in 11, but in one match, you break your leg. You're at home feeling sorry for yourself and waiting for words of sympathy when the telephone rings. What sort of a friend breaks his leg for charity? A friend who joined you in some of the happiest films Melvin. you made, Melvin no, no. Hayes. <laughs> what, what did you have to say on that job? That telephone call, Melvin. Well, what actually happened, we were doing a film called Wonderful Life. And, um, Don't take too long. No, we'll be very And I... I shut up. Sorry. And I broke my foot while we were filming. And we had one more dance number to do. It was called Home. And we had to do it on a boat. 
And I couldn't do it until the foot was better, you see. And every day on the call sheet, they used to put this little note which said, the dance number will be shot when Melvin Hayes is able to dance. <laughs> which is ridiculous, I couldn't dance before the accident. True. <laughs> and so anyway, the thing was, the film was finished, we still had to do this number, but we were on salary all the time. He was on salary as well, until my foot got better. The thing was, he earned enough money to get an electric organ. Then six months later, he phones me up and he says, what do you think, Melv? I broke my leg playing football. What sort of a friend breaks his leg playing football for charity? I mean, you know, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Melvin Hayes. Thank you. <laughs> so you're a song and dance man as well, Richard. Now, in that film, Wonderful Life, there was someone else singing and dancing with you, and I know the viewers will recognise them as they take a look at the three of you going through your routine. In your hometown, so you grab up that bag. Well, of course, that third member was none other than Cliff Richard. Right now he's on tour, but he does have a special message for you. And if you look at the screen over there, you'll see just what it is. Well, hi there, Richard. So they finally got you. I feel really glad that you were in my films because I feel they were steps up for me. And I felt, really, that I've been stepping on your back, too. I mean, you really gave me a tremendous lurch forward in my career. Anyway, it's, I hope it's going to be a tremendous evening. I'm sure it will. Once again, I wish I was there, but I'm not. So have a tremendous time. Goodbye and God bless. Thank you, Cliff Richard. <laughs> now, Richard, suddenly your career reaches a difficult stage. The boy actor grows up and the telephone stops ringing. Now, Jackie, that wasn't an easy time for Richard. A very difficult time. He was very disillusioned. He was very seriously thinking of immigrating to Australia. What was it like, suddenly, to be out of work? Uh, well, it wasn't very nice, actually. <laughs> um, well, it wasn't very nice. <laughs> All right. But three years ago, the phone did ring. You're offered a one-episode appearance in a new television comedy series, and it's just the tonic you need. And it was this character that did it, Dr. Bingham in the Doctor at Large series. <laughs> Good. I have no more to say. Uh, it is my day off, and you already delay me to get into the station. Good. I hope you missed your train. <laughs> Ah, oh, jeez, God, I'm not going anywhere. I'm train spotting. Well, I hope the Brighton Bell runs you over. <laughs> Cordia, the Brighton Bell it doesn't run anymore. I'm not fussy, Lawrence. Any train will do. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were such a success with this character, they wanted you for the rest of the series. And the man we've just seen alongside you in that clip is here tonight, actor and writer George Layton. <laughs> 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 Well, yeah. during that series, you, you were behind uh, an, another of Richard's successes. What, yes, what was that? yes, I must say that I... Uh, oh, you keep talking, keep talking. Yeah, no, I must say that uh, I helped Richard become a pop star. No, don't go away, Richard. Because, oh, I mean, you were approached by a record company to play the title role in a musical. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you think you could recognise the voice? No. You know, well, that's the only way of checking. Uh, wait, let's find, let, listen to it. Can we hear that uh, voice of Richard? Now we need the whole world, as I name, finds a funny little name, Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> you see, that was Richard? That was my boy. I taught him. What happened was, <laughs> right, what happened was, Richard came and said, you know, I'm <clears throat> making an LP, you know, the title <laughs> role, something called Grimple Stilton or something. And I said, Rumpelstiltskin. And he said, that's it. I said, you know, he's a goblin. <laughs> and of course, that frightened him, and he didn't want to do it. And so I took him to a pub, and I said, Richard, you just you got didn't, to... did you? Yeah, I said, you've got to drink. Oh, of course, gosh. of course. I said, all you've got to do is make a funny voice. <laughs> and that is, well... You should have done it. Who taught... No, no, it's terrific. But I think, uh, you know, the acting's a little bit better than the singing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, George Layton. Thank you. Now, <laughs> uh, Richard... Just before I finish, I want to take a look at one page in a scrapbook your mother keeps. <clears throat> in it is a letter dated Venice, July 28th, 1953. And it finishes, it's from a boyhood pal who turned out, as your mother said, to be a prince. It ends, I would like to see you again, in boyish handwriting, lots of love, your friend Alexander. Now, he was, in fact, Crown Prince Alexander of Yugoslavia and godson of Queen Elizabeth. Today he lives almost 6,000 miles away in South America, but tonight the wish in that letter, 21 years ago, becomes true, uh -huh. because with his wife, Princess Maria de Gloria, we have flown him from Rio de Janeiro, Prince Alexander. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, 
Prince Alexander, you and Richard were boyhood friends 21 years ago, and there's one memory you cherish most, isn't there? Do you remember tearing around the garden in Venice yes. on bicycles? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> oh, God. Well, we're absolutely thrilled with your successful career and the pleasure that you're giving to millions of people. It's really wonderful. Oh, Richard O'Sullivan, this is your life. Thank you.